Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Nick Lugo Show, where I study the tactics, practices, and principles of some of my favorite achievers. Today's guest will blow your mind. He goes by the name of Brett Hill, and he's here to talk to us about pretty much how the American lifestyle, the highly success focus driven lifestyle, has a dark side. We're not going to say it's wrong, but we're going to say that there's a strong, strong dark side when it comes to happiness, well, life success, and mindfulness. He's a mindfulness coach, and he's pretty much here to tell us, well, the opposite side. He's here to tell us from different cultures, from different religions, different views of the world, how our lifestyle is just another way of living, and maybe it's the wrong one. The hope in this episode is to make us more informed and really, really to give you a glimpse into the other ways of living and hopefully a better way of living. So I give you Brett Hill. So we must talk about the biggest, we'll say barriers to mindfulness because you are the mindfulness guy. You are the guy who really understands these things. And explain to me, why is it that so many people are addicted to social media nowadays? What is, what is your theories and how do we avoid it? With social media, well, the problem is we're neurologically vulnerable to um, those kinds of things. Have you ever seen people like that are like addicted to slot machines? And it's like they just stand there and push the button. And it's not yeah. that different than being on your phone and pushing the button and like, <laughs> oh, look, I got to win. Oh, I got to like, oh, wait, what? Now, combine that with the, the predisposition of our nervous systems to do to to um, react, overreact, I should say, to negative information. And so you get something like, and you and you look at shocking video that's going to just blow your mind. Okay, now why is it that that's the kind of thing, the yeah. more punchy, the more shocking, the more out there, the more crazy something is, the more it grabs people's attention because we're neurologically defenseless against um, those kinds of shocks, those kinds of um, messages. When they hit your nervous system, you just go, you yeah. just boom. Okay. That thing is a hormonal release. It's a nervous system response that's wired into our neurology. Um, I was uh, actually, I, I was a host of another podcast uh, recently, and I was uh, talking to Harvard professor, uh, Dr. Ron Siegel, and he was explaining that you know the brain, well, we all have them, right? And they're pretty great in a lot of cases, but they developed over millions of years to basically live in a world that did not have electronics, you know. Yep. And this is all new. This is all new to our neurology. You know, the internet grew up, and I mean, I'm an old guy, right? The internet grew up in my lifetime, and and it's kind of like. There, believe it or not, there was a time in life where you didn't know where people were and you didn't have the ability to like um, uh, connect so instantly. And so this the impact of all this technology, we really and I'm not I'm not a naysayer. I'm not like some guy. Well, this is the Internet's really ruined us. No, no, not at all. It's more like really, though, just from a scientific point of view, you say, what is the impact of this kind of technology on this kind of a nervous system? Well, that research is not in. We just don't know. Now, one of the things we do know is that, um, like I was saying, the, the nervous system is wired in such a way as to overreact to negative stimuli. Uh, and so, so consequently, the the social media machines, the systems, the AI algorithms. that drives them, the algorithms that are behind them, they are all designed to amplify any kind of activity. So what kind, you know, whether good or bad, they, they're really kind of neutral, like, but it just turns out that hmm. if you design a system that says, okay, whichever, whatever kind of message gets the most action, we're going to pump that message. Well, guess what kind of acti- message gets the most actions? The negative ones. It was actually... Uh, it was super interesting. I actually, I saw this podcast. Um, it was Rich Roll who had Andrew Humerman on. And Andrew Humerman is a Stanford neurologist and also ophthalmologist, but irrelevant. He, um, he brought up this crazy interesting study where they actually, this is a thing they, done, they did in the 1950s. You're allowed to do this. Well, not anymore, but, um, <laughs> but this actually doesn't cause any people any pain, which really surprises me. They actually removed people's skulls 
humans remove their skulls wow. and <laughs> yeah yeah well since the brain doesn't have any noceptive yeah there's no nerve endings um, strangely enough there's no pain receptors which is so weird right it's so <laughs> weird yeah like you don't feel pain in your brain like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not exposed to anything, right? So why would it develop a, uh, a pain receptor? Yeah, yeah. Like nobody expected anybody to pull apart their skull and start, start <laughs> zapping it. <laughs> okay, right, right. So. But that's what they did. So what they did was they they zapped all these different brain regions and they said, which one feels the best? Which one makes you want to continue doing this? Which one are you going to say, ah, yeah, I really don't like that. Oh, that's and, so creepy. <laughs> oh, super creepy. Super creepy. But with some great, some great answers. What they ended up finding was that the emotion that stimulated the most, ooh, I want to do this more, ooh, I want to do this more, was not happiness, but rather mild anger or frustration. Is that so? Yeah. Well, now that is really, you're right, that is really interesting. Right? Well, think about it, right? So you have a slot machine. What is a slot machine designed to do? It's not designed to make you feel good. It's designed to make you feel frustrated. It's designed to make you feel just a little bit angry. Enticed and angry, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, oh, crap. You know, and the goal, and this is scientifically proven also, also with lottery tickets, of it's going to get you as close as possible to a win. You know, it's going to make you feel like, oh, I almost had it. You know, you think of lottery numbers. You get five out of the six numbers, but you need all six to make the money. It's like, oh, you're like, ah, I almost had it. Let me go one more. Let me go mm-hmm. one more. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. and that's what it is. And that's what social media does to some degree, right? Twitter mm-hmm. is designed just to make you, you know, frustrated, obviously. News is designed to get you just a little <laughs> bit pissed off, you know, and and God. Just think, a little. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> think about that like that that idea just absolutely blows my mind that yeah. and also you know when you're scrolling on social media they've actually done studies on this it's like well you're not actually feeling happy when you're scrolling on social media you're That's just right. you're, you're feeling mildly frustrated they, people who you know are pinged whenever they're on social media are like right. ah, you know so, what? i'm not feeling that great so what's the impact of a hundred million people doing that for hours and hours and hours a day and we really don't know like what does that mean to jobs to businesses to families to relationships to to everything we and we and my contention is that um it's having a fairly negative impact on us in ways that we don't really understand and we won't understand for a little while okay Uh, so the the neurology is starting to catch up so give us a little bit of background tell us tell us who you are tell us your story you know we kind of skipped that part oh yeah tell us about what you're about and tell us about you know what the, the opposite. Tell us about consciousness instead of, let's say, barriers to consciousness. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's a, you know, we can wrap that up in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, my name is Brett Hill. I do um, somatic, mindful communications coaching. And mm-hmm. so that's a mouthful, but, uh, <laughs> and I've been through several reinventions of myself, but it's sort of like, that's, that's what I'm settled into these days. And basically what it amounts to is I help people identify, re-identify as themselves. Now that sounds weird and, and hyperbolic, but really what I, what happens is that in life, we get identified with our stories. We get identified with our pain, our suffering, we get identified with everything except for who we really are and who we really are is actually fairly core, fairly foundational. So let's just talk about, it's almost like if you believe that you were born as a somebody, as a something, and you feel like you have some characteristics or capabilities that if you were really, truly you really no limitations in terms of, uh, or ideas about what box you had to fit in, who would you be? Mm. And and letting you kind of settle, helping people kind of settle into the sense of, oh, this is my my true self. This is who I really am. And whenever people connect with that, there's this, ah, oh, there's this big relief and this, yes, there's this identification with and a recognition that this is really what I'm about. This is really who I am. And, and it's not about what other people think of me. It's not about, am I successful or do they like me or am I good at X, Y, Z? It's like, no, I truly am someone, regardless of what anybody thinks, I truly am someone who cares, who has a lot of passion, who wants to make a difference. And I've always been that way. That's always been me. So 
You want to hear something funny? So uh, earlier this morning, so this you were actually my second podcast of the day. And it just that's just the way the scheduling sort of worked out. And I had Jude Charles earlier this morning, and he talked about the importance of creating a narrative and the importance of creating something like, you know, simplifying your giant complex story into one tiny little narrative. And it's really funny because you are anti that. You know, you're you're the exact opposite. And the reason why is because, unfortunately, we feel a need in society to make some sort of persona, right? Put on some sort of mask. You know, for example, I could say, my name is Nick Lugo, and this is what I believe in. Here are all the core beliefs. That's true self. But then I kind of get clouded in, you know what? Well, I'm doing this for attention or or I could give myself yeah. the label of I'm X career or I'm a podcaster or, you know, mm-hmm. I have all these labels that are associated with this persona that I have. Yeah. And the reality is that's not truly me. That's right. That's not you. And I want to, I want to be clear that it's a good thing to be able to tell people kind of who you are in, mm-hmm. in tight, in a tight way. The key is for it to be authentic and mm-hmm. also that you aren't so attached to it that that supplants your authenticity. It's kind of like, well, I, I'm Brett, the mindfulness coach. And, and it's like, oh, that's who I am. And you know, somebody comes up and says, well, you're a terrible coach. It's like, no, how can you say that? Because I've got to, <laughs> okay. That, that guy who gets all pissed off about it is not the guy who knows the truth about who I am. Right. So, and so, so he identifies you, with the persona. Yeah. When you identify as the persona, that's where you get in trouble and you kind of lose yourself. And we're talking pretty kind of in there stuff in terms of what you might call a core identity that doesn't, you know, this is the kind of thing that doesn't really have names and is beyond language and all that kind of weird woo woo, but it's actually true. And when you feel into it, and that's the somatic part, the feeling into it, it's not an idea. Like even this, if we talk about it, of course, it's just an idea, but we're, we can talk about the Grand Canyon. It's just an idea, but there is a Grand Canyon. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when you go there, you experience it and you don't know what it is until you do that. So, so let me break that down. I think, I think it, before we get into the somatic part of it, I think we just need to explain, you know, really make it tangible. And one of the things that it, it really makes sense to me, you know, the way I like to think about it is that I I'm surrounded by finance majors, right? So I'm in the in <laughs> university, the Kelly school of business, the future wall street bankers, the future people who are in my opinion and in the opinion of themselves, just doing it for the money, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, they're in finance. They're in finance, you know. Like and, what, what's the, I mean, I don't mean to diss any people in finance, but I'm like, what's the higher calling there? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like you're, you're there to run the financial systems because it makes you money. And that's, that's sort of the way it works. And the, the, the interesting thing about that is that people don't realize this. And this is, this is the thing that just, well, brings all this together is when you become a finance major or a get the career in finance, You also, to succeed in that job, must become a finance person, right? You also must adopt the characteristics of somebody who does finance. And you also must, well, let's say, adopt that sort of persona. So let's say, what do we think of when we think of a finance persona? A finance persona is something like somebody who's very mind-based, very rational, very level-headed, and is always thinking about plans and strategies and rationale and trying to predict the future and doing all of these things. The problem with that is that unfortunately in this society, if you do that, if you think so rationally, if you use your mind so much, and part of it is the fact that you're working 80 hour weeks. So you have to sort of reject, you have to constantly be rejecting these feelings that are coming in from inside of you saying, well, maybe you shouldn't be working 80 hour weeks. Maybe Mm. you're tired. Maybe you're blah, blah, blah. Maybe you Mm. shouldn't be doing this. And then what ends up happening is you lose connection to your body. You lose connection to your feelings and you're basically just all mind. And one of the things that really makes solidifies this is that while the people who are trying to go into finance are trying to imitate robots, they are trying to... (laughs) They're trying to be as efficient as possible, run their algorithms and predict the future as well as possible so that they could predict how much, how many loans they could get in stocks and all that good stuff. I don't really need to get into that. And the the reality is they are trying to completely be all brain, all rational brain, adopt that persona, and then completely reject the body as a result. So now let's bring it together. So now 
why does somebody need to get in touch with their body? What is the difference between somebody who is just all mind and somebody who is well connected to themselves? Well, one person is alive and one person is it, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's like, if you want to, and I don't mean like dead, like physically mortally dead, but you could take that same discussion you're talking about, which is, which is um, you, you've got a, you know, a very vivid uh, framework around the this persona mm-hmm. and replicate it into a lot of different uh, types of um, jobs, as well as people in general. In mindfulness yep. world, there's a thing they call the default mode network. The default mode network is the neurological state that you're in uh, whenever, and it, this is, refers to a neural network, and it's a neural network that fires whenever you're just running on ordinary. You're just walking through your day, doing what you ordinarily do, and you're not really you, you ever seen like a YouTube video, some guy looking at his phone and he falls over into a fountain or step, almost steps <laughs> in front of a book. Okay. That's kind of the way people are in the default mode network uh, in life. If you took away the phone, they're just walking around in their head, thinking about tomorrow, thinking about what they should have been thinking about what they could do next, thinking about thinking about something other than the experience that they're having right now as a living human breathing on the planet. Mm. Other than who am I? What's going on around me? Gosh, look at that. That's a sky. Holy crap. That's incredible. What is this sky? Then it's like huge. It's massive. It's gorgeous. You know, I, I don't even remember seeing that before. It's kind of like waking yeah. up to the fact that we're in this incredible moment. Yeah. And so mindfulness is very much about being present with your moment and your experience in the moment on purpose. So you make a choice. I choose to be present so you you walk down the street you look at your phone you go you know what i'm looking at my phone and i don't know anything about what's around me right now maybe i should pay attention and so you look around you go oh wow this is nice i like it here you know look at these people you know and you connect to your experience in the moment and whenever you do you're no longer on the default mode network now you're in a conscious network because you chose to pay attention now that's actually a different part of the brain. Yes. There's, that's that's a higher cognitive function that and there's a part of the brain that manages that. This is monitoring system in the brain that we have this capacity. That's really a higher order function. It's really truly one of the unique things that humans do that other animals don't is they can be we can become aware of being aware. And uh the fact that that's possible opens up massive doors for for people in terms of their quality of life and their authenticity and the ability to connect and find meaning and purpose and realize, Oh my God, I don't know how much money I'm going to make, but I'd rather be alive than rich, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and sort of like, and there are plenty of people who are plenty rich and really unhappy. And so if the point of working that hard is to get, is to be successful, well, what counts as success? Is it waking up in the morning feeling like you're living a fabulous life and you love your life? Or is it waking up with, you know, $10 million in the bank? So there was a great quote that I read earlier today, actually. And it was, um, it was, well, if you're worried so much and you spend your time worrying about eating next week, if you spend all your time worrying about whether or not you're going to have food on your plate next week, and you're not focused on the food that you're eating at the current moment, then you will never truly experience your food because the next week, you will be focusing on the food that you're going to get two weeks from now. And then you're going to focus on the, you know, and it is a perpetuating cycle that you are never truly living. And unfortunately you are literally just, you know, not a person. (laughs) You're not, not what I sometimes think of it as like a human V2. Like uh, it's sort of like, I feel like we're on the cusp because there's a ton of mindfulness research that's, coming into focus now, there's been, you know, tens of thousands of studies now. I mean, we're not talking about um, small studies, but, you know, really, really well-established institutions and peer-reviewed tens of thousands over decades now, plus the neuroscience and the neuroimaging that's coming online now to show that, oh my God, when I sit down and and you take a bunch of people and you say, I don't have to do this mindfulness meditation, it actually increases the gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. It's measurable. 
So these people reported, well, you know, I feel so much better. I'm more calm. I'm more resilient. I'm happier. I seem to be, I'm making better decisions. I'm having better conversations. I'm, I'm seeing ways to do things in my world I didn't see before. Not that much different than dealing with someone who's just a bunch smarter, um, given the same set of problems. Yep. Which life would you rather have? Well, if so, you could sit down in 10 minutes a day, have that other life, why wouldn't you do that? So it's really interesting. You know, you talk about this and and I think that was the um that was the thing that we started this conversation about, you know, something like def- when we think about it, okay, in which state are you conscious, right? Let's define mm-hmm. consciousness in a in a, you know, in an easy sense at the moment, right? So are you conscious if you're scrolling on your phone and you're and you're going through we call that mindless scrolling, of course, or are you conscious if you're focusing on your work? That's another question because let's say when you're when you're scrolling through your phone, you are intensely focused, right? You are yeah. intensely focused on this screen. Literally, the rest of the world does not exist. But then when you're focusing on your homework, for example, you're also highly focused and you're also yeah. tuning out the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. And you brought mm-hmm. up you brought up this idea that, well, when you let go of this focus, when you let go of this part of your, let's say, default mode. No, I wouldn't even call that the default mode network. That is when you let go of this focus, then maybe that expands your consciousness because consciousness could be seen as, well, it is viewing the world. Why would I restrict my consciousness to this one tiny little device or this one tiny thing to focus on? Rather, I think it was Aldous Huxley who said it. He said, humans have only been able to tap into this tiny little part of consciousness and therefore... (laughs) Therefore, we're missing out on the rest. Yeah. So you you bring up a good point. And one of the things you're talking about is what, what you might think, I think about one of the characteristics of our consciousness is its fluidity, right? So we have this capacity yep. to kind of flow our focus into certain focuses of attention. And the question is, where am I in all of this, right? So you're bringing up a good point about the quality of attention. So if I'm just if my if I'm just daydreaming about how I didn't get the date or I bombed out on the test or I don't know if I'm going to get the interview or I did well on whatever if I'm just thinking about all the things there's nothing wrong with those things there's not we're not not here to say you shouldn't be thinking about the future or the past it's just that if that's all that you do you're missing yeah. out on your life and yeah. so the, the 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 task at hand is to develop the capacity to think about the things that you need to think about when you need to think about them and not be ruled by just letting your mind wander wherever it wants to go. And because we already know that we have a mind that was built for a world that we're not in right now, yep. <laughs> you know, like millions yep. of years ago. And so if we do that, other people are going to hijack your attention and profit from it. And so, so go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, let me tell you, so this week I've been going on a personal experiment. So right now it's Thursday night. And my parents and family, so and brothers too, are coming in on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So what I said was, you know what? Let me see if it's possible to pack four days, uh, seven days of work into four days, and we'll see if we could do it. So I set my goals, I set my schedule. I, I literally, it. I've been working for these last four days, something like. 14, 15, 16 hours a day, brutal days, you know, and part of it is throughout that time, I have to be highly, highly focused throughout the entire time. And a few breaks, you know, in between, but but mostly I am highly focused. And what I realized is that, well, I'm I'm in retrospect, I'm saying, or and during the moment, I'm saying, am I enjoying this? You know, am I happy? And am I sort of how how is sort of the time going? Because I think that's mm-hmm. one of the most important things. And this week went so fast. It literally, like, I felt like I was sort of a passive player through it, and mm. it was just kind of running through me. And it but was. But what was the answer to the question? Are you enjoying it? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would say no. Well, I I mean, check. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Henry David Thoreau, okay, one of my favorite quotes of all time, he says, I decided to retreat into the woods because I didn't want to feel this feeling of when I go and I walk onto my deathbed discover that I had not lived. That's, and, a, that's an amazing quote. Yeah. 
it's so good. And, and it, and it really, it really highlights this idea of a restricted consciousness. It really highlights this idea of focus. Let's say you spend your entire life focusing on making money, let's say, because that is the American problem. And you know what? You spend 40 years. No, no, 20 to 65. Okay. 45 years. You spend 45 years with one focus. I'm going to make money. I'm going to provide for my family and I'm going to provide for myself. Those 45 years go by fast. Yes, they do. Tell I'll testify. <laughs> <laughs> and then you might be sitting there on your deathbed and you're like, holy crap, I didn't yep. live those 45 years. I was not living. I was spending eight of my hours not enjoying my time. And then I was now, spending- Don't do the- that. So tell everybody you know at your age, don't do that. Well, let me tell you. So I'll tell you what exactly is, is happening because- this is the breeding ground. I'm in, I'm in, I'm, I'm surrounded by finance and accounting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like, this is it, you know? <laughs> and what they say is, and this is, this is, it's, it's so interesting to me. Whenever I talk to them, they never say I'm going to be a finance person until I'm 65. Nobody says that. Nobody says that at all. What they say is either I'm retiring by the time I'm 25 or 30. Right. So basically I'm going to lose 10 years of my life, but then I'll have the 65 have years. Money. Yeah, I'll have money and I'll have freedom for the next 65 years. Or they'll say, well, one day I'm going to be CEO. One day I'm going to be an entrepreneur. One day I'm going to go into private equity. I'm going to do you know, venture capital and all these things, the things that I really enjoy. And it's really interesting because, well, maybe some of those people definitely are, right? Maybe some of those people are going to be the entrepreneurs. Maybe some of those people are going to retire yeah. by, the time, by, by the time they're 25. But a majority of those people that I talk to are going to be going into finance or something that they don't particularly enjoy for the next 65 years. And I, I kind of see it as something, not that you plan, nobody plans, or at least in our generation to go to 65 and work for a job that they hate for 40 years. But I feel like it kind of shoestrings. It's kind of like, okay, you know what? Ah, crap. You know, like maybe I should go for the next five years until I'm 25, then I'll retire then. And then you get a kid and a family and you're like, okay, you know, maybe I should go till 30 and then maybe I should go till 35. And we sort of trick ourselves throughout this entire time. And, um, and then you wake up and you wake up. And I say that literally you wake up and you're 65 and you just wasted 45 years. Yeah. And you can't get it back. So, you know, start young to pay attention to the quality of your experience, because that's what matters. It really is about, um, you know, we kind of breezed by some key issues that you raised, like if you're looking at your, if you're doing your homework, are you conscious? And I would say you're aware and you have a concentration going on, but the kind in the way I talk about consciousness is a awareness of your experience. So if you're paying attention mm. and you and something snaps into your head and says, you know what, I'm holding myself in a position that I don't really, it feels bad because I've been cramped over this paper, this book for like two hours, right? I'm going to stretch. Now that moment, a circuit in your system woke up and said, I'm experiencing uncomfortable, so I'm going to move. So there, you got back into an experience of your moment because your nervous system is wired with these nerve endings that say you need to readjust your, your arrangement in the physical world in relation to gravity because it's hurting you right now. Yep. And, and that was enough to kind of snap you out of your trance of focus to pay attention to your experience. If you just chose to extend that a little bit, take a breath and go, man, I'm really feeling nervous about this or yeah, I'm going to get there. This is a real pain in the ass, but you know, I'm feeling pretty good about where I'm at and let yourself have this check-in moment with your bigger picture, those little doorways, those little moments can mean a ton because those are the ways that you can tell if you need to make a course correction along the way. So as you start to go ahead. well, Well, that's the thing. That's living right there, right? That is living. That's saying, okay, I am a human being and this is what I'm feeling. And while I was highly focused on my test and I was completely immersing myself in my test, for the moment, I'm just going to be a human and I'm going to notice how I feel and I'm going to notice what I'm doing. And that is, if that's not consciousness, I don't know what is. No, that's the beginning. That's the doorway. Mm-hmm. That's that's the opportunity to be conscious. It's like, it's kind of sort of like <clears throat> the moment you bring that nervous system, that part of your brain online, you're, you, you take a seat in your perception of now I am aware of the inputs into my organism. Mm-hmm. I'm aware that, and this is, I think of it like that. I think of it like there's a screen of perception and I'm perceiving sight, sound, temperature, emotions, uh, thoughts, memories, 
Um, all of those things are a part of what's going on in me. And if I just sit and be in relationship to all of that and go, oh, here's how I feel about these things. And here's my moment. Then I'm much better equipped to deal with the things that come in my way, the decisions I have to make, because I'm, I'm not attached to any particular one of them um, or, or overreacting. One of them isn't jangling my nervous system so much. Like if you're angry, you're just staying with that anger. And so you're missing out on 10 other pieces of input. That's like, yeah, I'm really angry, but you know, this other opportunity is over here and it really is a good opportunity for me, but I'm not even going to pay attention to that because I'm so pissed off. Yeah. And I think that's something so interesting. Like, you know, we just, we just established a concept and I don't think, I don't think we, we stated it directly. Focus is a barrier to consciousness. Mm -hmm. Focus is the opposite of consciousness. And yeah, and attention. And like, wow, wow. Like, you know, when we think of focus, we think of- I'm going to interrupt you a little bit. Can I do that? that Go for it. Yeah. Uh, Because it's it's, it's not so much that you don't want to have focus. It's that you want your focus to be about your experience. Mm. Okay. So, so yes, it looks like we have two definite different definitions of focus. So yes, my focus is hyper, hyper, um, hyper, let's say focused. Your attention is all placed on one aspect. On an object or an, on object, an object. That's this. Yeah. That's not really you. It's like, it's not your experience. It's, it's something else other than my experience. Right? Okay. I like that. Yep. So, okay. So we focus on the experience. So, okay. That's a, that's a good transition. So now we've gone through, let's say the first barrier. Yeah. Sorry. College dorm room, but (laughs) 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 gotta own it. I know my friends, I think some sort of sports game is going on. I'm not sure. (laughs) It's college. (laughs) Go sports. Yeah, of course. There's a sports going on, right? Yeah. Come on, how am I supposed to blame them? But you know, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you know, first the first problem of consciousness, or the first problem of yes, let's say, um, let's say being of living, let's say, is this highly attentive focus on some sort of object. Now yeah. let's say, okay, we get past that barrier. We get past, okay, you know what? I'm not focusing on all of these barriers and distractions and all of these things. Now bring me into okay. What is the opposite? What is consciousness? How do you use the body? Well, a different state is taking that focus instead of being laser focused. And there is a time and a place for that. There's so I want to be clear. That's not wrong. Mm -hmm. There's a time and a place for that. You need to study and you can't be thinking about what's the meaning of life while you're trying to do advanced calculus, you know? So, so, so you, you are sitting there and you take, you, you take a breath, you take stock, you beware, become someone walks in the room you take a breath and you notice how you feel. You know, I really don't like this guy or, or I'm really attracted to this guy or this girl or whatever's going on. Just noticing what does that feel like in your body and in your mind? And what is it? What make, what, what are you moved? I want to step back. I want to step in. I want to say these things and not, and that doesn't mean doing them automatically. It doesn't mean not doing them because at that point you're not doing anything automatically. One of the beautiful things about being in this space is that you have choices. Mm. You have choices that you didn't have before. And so really one of my key lines that I say in my work is that mindfulness is about freedom. It's about the the most mindful person in the room has the most choices. Is and I, actually, it's funny. I was thinking about that the other day. You know, I thought it, I, it's really interesting. So I was at the gym and I noticed that um, everybody who goes to the gym wears headphones right? That's just the way it is. Everybody listens to their music. And I noticed that, well, and I was thinking about this in terms of quiet mind. So, so very similar concepts, somebody who has a quiet mind is in this case, mindful, right? Obviously. And they are able to, in this case, not focus on the thing that's the most immediately present. So for example, right? Very simply, let's say somebody plays some really loud music in the room right? The person who does not have a quiet mind, the person who is not mindful is immediately going to draw their attention to that, um, to that sound because they are not quiet enough to be like, you know what? I could, I have this ability, this choice to block out the sound and focus on someone else. But the enlightened one, the person who is able to, well, let's say, well, have choice is able to, yes, tune out that environment, tune out all of the annoyance and the sounds that exist and therefore 
focus on whatever he wants to focus on. And but that is potentially, freedom. you know, potentially it's sort of like that's, let's just say that scenario becomes possible for someone who becomes aware of, Oh my God, that's so loud. I'm or, or obnoxious or whatever. And I'm, I'm just going to choose to be in touch with my breathing and not really let that distract me. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about this with meditation, people who practice meditation really strongly um, or as I should say, seriously, um, will frequently go to a really noisy place to meditate mm. as a as a way just to be okay with the fact that it's not, you don't let it irritate you. Um, Eckhart Tolle, no, no, was it wasn't Eckhart Tolle? It was a uh, uh, there was a teacher who was really popular, um, spiritual teacher a while back, um, Krishna Murthy, um, be before your day, and he um, was a kind of a precursor to. A lot of the like Eckhart Tolle and some other teachers who teach about being in the moment. And okay. one of the things he said, this, my secret is I don't let anything bother me. Mm. And and he, what he was really saying is being accepting the moment as it is, is a key part to remaining peaceful in your life. And now that causes a lot of controversy and thought for people to go like, well, what do you mean? I'm not okay. I'm not okay with the injustice in the world. I'm not okay that they treated me. It doesn't mean that the things that are happening in your life are just or fair, but it does mean that you need to accept what is happening as a fact that it is in fact happening or did happen in the case of like, let's say you were born without an arm or a leg or, or you got hurt by somebody. And so you, you have a lip for the rest of your life. Rather than living as someone who's angry for the rest of their life about the fact that you shouldn't have, you're going to be a runner and you've got it limp now and they took that opportunity. Okay, you can be that person. You can have that life. Or you could say, yeah, this has happened. I'm someone who had an unfair thing happen to me and I have a limp now. Mm. And that's just who. Now, the question is, who do I want to be that this is so? Who okay. do I choose to be? that this is so. And so you look around your life, you go, here are the facts of my life. I'm, these are the circumstances that caused me to be where I am right now. And you just say yes to all of those things. Not yes in the sense that it's all okay, but the fact that it's present. Another quick example is like you're driving down the road, you have a flat tire, or you get out of the car and you rant and you rave for half an hour about the flat tire. Doesn't change the fact that you, that you have a flat tire. <laughs> Right. And so you, you could spend 10 more years ranting about that flat tire. It doesn't change the fact that nothing's going to happen until you deal with the flat tire. Yeah. Except makes, that you waste 10 years of anger. <laughs> well, it makes sense. You know, I like to think of it in um, actually a good a good way of looking at it is also another example is the political example. You know, like it's really simple or yeah, we'll go with the political example. You know, it's really easy for somebody to take the simple path, right? The simple yeah. path is something like creating a narrative. True, right? Yeah, of course, right? The yeah, easy yeah. way, you know, and what is the easy way? The easy way is to choose a narrative and run with it. Something like the left is good and the right is evil, or the right is good and the left is evil, you know, and, and that is exactly what is trying to be created. The narrative of, well, this is this is what's happening. And every single thing that happens, you just fit it into the narrative and it's super simple. And I've been in many political discussions over the last few weeks where, where that's, I noticed that like people yeah. just take information and they kind of filter it into the narrative and anything that doesn't agree with them, any truth, any complexity, right? Anything that's not simple. Well, it gets rejected. No, nope, I yeah, don't want to deal with it. But that's neurology. That's your neuro. That's your brain at work. That's what your brain does. It's your confirmation brain bias. Is, yeah. It's confirmation bias. And also we mentioned before the story, like aligning with the story. Yep. So let's just say that I decide that I'm, um, uh, let's just pick something that, that would be in my world. Like, let's just say that I decide that I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a psychic. I'm a woo woo psychic. Right. And that's who I am. That's my, my definition of my life. Right. Okay. And so, um, and then I start to get, I start to make some predictions and they don't go well, you know, they're not going now. Am I going to reevaluate the fact that I'm a psychic? No, I'm going to say, well, you know, this and that, and this and there's these things it's because of attachment to my identity. Remember we said before yep. becoming attached to your soul. So these count these packages, I call you know packages of belief, uh, belief uh, concepts. I'm left. I'm right. I'm whatever. 
Those are ideas that you identify with. And then when someone attacks the idea, it feels like they're attacking you mm -hmm. because you're identified with the idea. Mm, that that's brings the, a lot of it together. Okay. That, that's why people react so viscerally to factual information that doesn't align with, and, and or I should say, it's why people are so resistant to factual information that could prove them wrong because they don't really care about the factual information. They only are interested in, in uh, integrity of their concept about who they are. Because people will defend it literally to the death. They will what? literally... It's like you've you've seen these uh, you've read about maybe these guys who die from COVID going, this can't be real. This is a fake. This is a <laughs> real, and they're they're dying, you know. And they still are so attached to their idea that they that that it couldn't be so, that they just don't get it. That's how powerful that part of our neurology is. And remember, we started off with this conversation. So we don't know the impact of social media on this nervous system. This yep. is a big, big part of it, that people can become identified with, with value systems that really aren't good for them, but they will defend them as if it were their blood. And, and, that's, and that's a defect in us as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's the thing. So we'll take it one step deeper. And this is something that actually you said, I just want to highlight it, is that the, we feel the need to control things. We feel the need to make sense of things. Yeah, and there you go. Well, of course, right? If, if you have some sort of ideology, if you have some sort of belief system that, well, of course, denies the, the complexity of the world, denies the facts of the world, well, what are you doing? You're saying, I value something like security. I value something like control over the truth. And in other words, I am not able to handle the complexity of the world. It's too much for me. I'm not strong enough. I think Frederick Nietzsche, actually, he was the one who said, I can judge the strength of a man by how much truth he can tolerate. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, who was the other person who said it? Who said, um, who said uh, I can judge the strength of a man. A man is only strong if he can hold two contradictory ideas in, inside of his head and still remain sane. Yeah, I love, I love that. that. Well, there's a lot to that. There, our ability to tolerate incongruence is very limited. And, and it's one of the practices of mindfulness is a thing they call being non-judgmental. Um, and it doesn't mean that you don't have discernment. It just means that you try not to snap judge things because we're really bad at it in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and so because of this neurology. So you're, you, you said some important things here in terms of what you're hitting on is characterizing the way our, our nervous systems work. Mm -hmm. our, our nervous systems are designed to make sense of our experience, right? So here's a question I ask people sometimes, and it's like, what do you think that you don't believe? What do I think that I don't believe? So I think that I don't believe that. No, 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 no. What don't you believe? What I'm trying to I mean, let me say it another way, maybe more clearly. Okay. Um, what do you believe is, what do you, what thoughts do you have that you believe are false? Mm, okay. Okay. God. Is that, am I, am I supposed to answer this? No, no. I said, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's the, I'm trying to highlight the nature of our mind and the nature of our relationship to it is that there's really nothing in our heads that goes on that we label as, Oh, that was a false idea. Oh, there's an idea. That one's false. You yeah. know, we don't have that as a process Filter. very much. Right. Yeah. Instead it's like, well, here's an idea. Yeah. And then there's a, Oh, that's true. And Oh yeah, that. And it's like, it's a series of, Oh yeah, that's now occasionally they will be like, uh huh. What's that about? That moment is a very powerful moment. Um, you, I, most college kids have heard of cognitive dissonance. That's, an, that's the state of cognitive dissonance, right? Yep. Well, what, what's that? And you experience this discomfort of, I'm not sure. I'm trying to figure it out. Now, that's a state of neurologically being very highly aroused in the sense of your brain is in a very highly learning, uh, high learning state at that point. You can practice that. You can practice this high learning state by simply learning to suspend it. So you have an experience and rather than put a label on it, you just practice taking a pause and go, oh, I'm just going to hang out with this experience. What mm. is that? I don't know what it is, but it feels like, mm, it feels like that. Yeah. yeah. 
And so you just hang out with the experience and let yourself have a direct, nonverbal, ex- non-cognitive experience. Non-labeling, yeah. I, I, That's I, what som- somatic means. Yeah, so I, I learned that um, through Buddhism and yeah, yeah, yeah. the way of Zen. And I just... Um, the Way of Zen by Alan Watts. Read that book. Listen to the audiobook. <laughs> Incredible book. And um, and it just like it was so difficult. It was so difficult because I realized that I had spent so much time converting my experiences into words. You know, yeah. like whenever That's I felt what the brain does. Yeah, like you know, I I tried to feel happy, so I felt happy. So I noted that I felt happy, and then I recognized that I felt happy, and then I. I was like, okay, you know what? That makes sense. But I never just felt happy, you know, just like I, yourself be in the feeling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh, that's perfect phrasing. And yeah, like it just, it just, it never worked like that. So then I sat down, I meditated, I did the Buddhist stuff and I still do that because I absolutely love it. And, um, and it's a completely different experience. It's an Boy, experience. It that's the thing because ding, ding, you- ding, 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 ding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Right. Because when you note the experience, it ceases to be the experience. Happiness is an emotion and it is something, yes, that's, it's not something, you know, you could figure out with, I don't know how to phrase this right, but when you note the happiness, the happiness kind of goes away because happiness is non-cognitive. It is a feeling. And when you, when you feel the feeling and you don't feel the need to label it, to cognitively label it, then you're truly experiencing. Then you're really present. You've really gotten yourself into a state of I'm, I'm present. I know that I'm present. No one can tell you that you're not present. It's not an idea. It's not a philosophy. It's just beingness and the experience of your being in the moment. That's truly what it means to be awake in the moment. And I must tell you that some of my greatest experiences that I've ever had in terms of introspective experiences, not anything with friends, because I haven't tried this yet with friends. It's just <laughs> Well, there's a frontier for you. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a whole different ball game. But just there there are some times where I'll literally this happened like three weeks ago. I'm sitting down and I'm just I finished my meal and I was just sort of relaxing. I was just like not thinking about anything, just letting everything come to me. And not cognitively, I wasn't trying to do this. It just, it just happened. And um, and man, I just like there was one moment where I felt so conscious. Like I was mm-hmm. hearing the footsteps of the people in the room, I was hearing all the sounds. I felt my body, like I just felt it. It just you know, usually yeah. like we don't realize that we have a body, you know, like in this conversation, we could say, I, you know, I'm not feeling my hands. I felt my hands. I felt my mm-hmm. body and I felt so conscious. I felt so aware that I got goosebumps and that I laughed and I just like, I was like, I can't handle this. Like I literally can't handle this much consciousness and yeah. then dropped it. It was. Yeah. Insane. So, but, but it was an interesting doorway into um, a doorway of perception open for you there. It sounded yep. like a yep. pretty big one. And oh, uh, it was, it was those incredible. can be like changing moments. There, there's a whole wrap on thing called states and stations. And it has mm-hmm. to do with more of a spiritual. Um, it's, a, it's a spiritual lesson, but it's, it applies to, to all kinds of things. It's, in this case, you had an, you had an experience of a state, yeah, a state of consciousness. And if it be a station is, is like you pull in and you stay there. Right. And that becomes your new baseline. And uh oh. So that was kind of the thing. So I literally like I I realized in that moment that I had so much consciousness and for whatever reason I I was like I can't handle it. I can't take it. It's too much. And um and I we'll just trust, we'll trust that. What do you mean? Well, that's your instinct, right? Your instinct came in, something came in and said this is overwhelming me and yep. and took you offline. And I would say trust that. Yeah, like I was so okay with it. I I, I saw yeah, that yeah. as an incredibly positive experience because I'm like, you know what? The like, first of all, that was one of the highest levels of consciousness I've ever yeah, achieved. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and another one is like, you know what? Maybe I'm not. You know, like maybe it's a growing stage. And and I know that if I try, right? And this is one of the main concepts that we sort of been parsing through this entire time is if I try to change things, if I try to create that type of experience, that's just that's just foolish. It is foolish because you're basically pushing yourself out of the moment to do that, (laughs) you know, and so, which is exactly where that experience is. And the thing is, it's available to you anytime you can just land back into your, your presence enough to let yourself open to have that 
experience. And, you know, the practice is to just kind of titrate that into your, so you have to tune up your nervous system so that it can handle it. And it yeah. takes, it takes some time um, and some practice to do that. And you can say, well, how can you prepare if you're going to practice? Said, well, there are things you can do is like I can, uh, in the practice of being present, there are there are routines and once again, let's get back to neurology. Mm -hmm. If you do certain kinds of practices, you prepare a neurological state to be that's preconditioned to have certain kinds of experiences. And one of these is the kind of thing you're talking about where you can just kind of relax into your awareness and suddenly, whoa, whoa, everything is on my, I call it my radar. Everything is on my radar. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything is like, I'm, I'm becoming aware of, of everything in the room and everything around me, 360 degree experiences is, is a very a common, I'm going to say common, but you know, lots of people have had experiences like this and they, they tend to have characteristics. And yeah. so you can say, you can, there are some names, it's, it's expansive, it's connected, it's peaceful. If there's a center, there's a say, there's a sense of rightness about it. There's a sense of connectedness to it. All those things are, are, are fairly common in, in that world. Um, and it's a, great world to be in yeah. and it is the world we are actually in <laughs> if it wasn't for all of this preconditioned mind stuff that takes us out all the time well that's the thing that i find really interesting like and this this goes back to like putting our consciousness into an object you know like right now i am and this is you know like i wouldn't i wouldn't say i'm uber conscious i wouldn't say i'm in that state right now all my focus is on you and all of your focus is on me but when I'm in that state, when I'm in that beautiful state, I, I really felt like I was more passive than active. Like yeah. I was just sort of a fly on the wall, just sort of observing the world. And I uh. didn't feel any need to. And this is this is kind of it. Like I felt no need to control. I just I just accepted things as they were. Right. That, that's that's part of the package. It's like there there's. There's a, a little bit of um, passive can be a little bit too, how should I say? Um, oh, I see. I see. You, you see what I mean? It's not yes. like you're just like letting things roll over you. It's a very active passive. In other words. Yeah. It, it, it's a very, uh, a, it's not assertive. Yeah. It's, uh, what's the word I want to say? It's, Emer uh, yeah, it's like emergent. It's like this, there's this like the moment, if we're really going to get in there, it's like the moment is just basically awakening in you every, every second and your breath is, and you're just present with it mm. and every, and it's reborn anew every moment. And you could almost think about it. We could get into quantum, like quantum bubbles, right? You're kind of experiencing the yep. birth of the quantum bubbles, you know, you can, and I don't know if that's true or not, but it, but it, it's sort of like. There's this hyper uh, hyper awareness in it where you're just becoming a, you're aware of everything, but you're not directing anything. You're not like, I am now going to. There's no one. Literally, you don't. You, you, you the notion of who I am and all of that changes radically. Yeah, like there's no actor. Of, yeah, nobody's yeah. acting. It's just yeah, it just is. It. Yeah. yeah, it just is. And and that's the thing. Come on, like. What one of the one of the greatest quotes I heard was from Joseph Campbell. He said, uh, "He said the greatest things that that we experience in the world we can't talk about because language doesn't. That's right. Doesn't That's have it. Sure. The second greatest things are the things that get muddled in language because they're so difficult that we can't damn talk about it. And then the third best things are the things that we talk about. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think you know." Um, God, like, first of all, we're, you see how much, how much we're both struggling with, like trying to figure out the language and the, and, and I've been doing this for decades, you know, and yeah, it's still a struggle because we're trying to use the brain to figure out things that are not, yeah, the you, and you can't, just like I mentioned before, you can't, um, you can't describe the Grand Canyon to somebody who hasn't been there. You can't just, you know? yeah. Red describe you know, to you, me red. You, you have to go to it and experience it. Then, you know. It's, and and until then, it's just words, it's just ideas, and that's the problem when people hear this kind of language and they go, "Well, I don't know about this being thing." It's kind of like, a, and, and you know, yes, that's true. It's a concept until it's an experience, until you know. And when you and when you do experience it, then no one can. Once you've been to the Grand Canyon, no one can tell you that it wasn't what you experienced. Yeah, because yeah. you know, when I say, "Well, I read a book that said it was like this." Well, good. I'm glad you read the book, but you know, and in your head, you're going, you know, I 
I don't know what this guy's talking about because I know what it's like because I was there. Yeah, and this, that's it what real. it's like. Yeah, that's what it's like when someone tries to tell you about consciousness and beingness when you have a direct experience of it. There's no question about it. There's no faith involved. There's no belief involved. It's your direct experience. And that's that's something that's just incredibly, incredibly interesting because we're like, okay, you know what? How exactly do you like, you know, do that, right? So, you know, like people- That's I, the I, trap, right? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. So I had an interview yesterday with somebody who had the eight steps to meaning, right? And um, eight keys to meaning, eight tenets of meaning. And um, first of all, it was a great conversation. You know, it was, it was a really great conversation. But then at the same time, how do you, you know, like, and one of his tenants was actually experience because it's like, okay, you know what? Everybody has, let's say a, um, you could, you could believe whatever you want, right? You could believe anything, but then at the end of the day, the experience is the thing that makes it real. The thing that solidifies it, you know? And I, I, I see that in marketing. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> you could be that guy on, on this deathbed. Who's like saying, I can't be dying. This isn't happening. You know, it's like, he's still denying his experience. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? It's like, well, what do you do about that? That's right. Good. Exactly. Well, you pay attention to the fact that that's possible. Yeah. That, 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 that can happen. That people can literally be dying and deny their experience. That really concerns me. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like, well, that's, that's the, that's the bigger question. And, you know, Oh God, I, I guess we're getting into the spiritual, but it's it's something like, you know, <laughs> we passed that threshold a while back. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You know, the, the Buddhist mentality is you have to connect to consciousness, right? Like you need to become conscious. I'm sorry about the sound that's going on outside. That's just the way it is. But um, I'm, I'm not trying to change it. I'm just I'm just going to just be with it. it, man. Just be, just with, be with it. Take the know? podcast out there. Yeah. Right. Maybe I'll start asking them some questions. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, like when you, when you say, oh crap, did I, did I lose it? I think I lost it. What was I saying? <laughs> Consciousness. Yes. So yeah, they say, so they say, you know, when, the, when you die, you know, it may be the goal, you know, that's what the Buddha did. He experienced the eighth level of consciousness. He really, by the time that he died, he said, well, it's my time to go, you know, like I've already sort of got in, gotten in touch with this consciousness and I'm okay. I've allowed for life to happen. And, um, and then you have the other, the opposite. You have the people that cling on to life. You have the people who say, you know what? Well, I guess, I guess, you know what? I, all, all I care about is this tiny little consciousness that I, that I've been able to grasp onto this, this simple thing that I've been able to hold onto. And I don't want to let that go. Why would I want to let that go? And well, it's God. a pretty great, it's a pretty great place to be. Yeah. I mean, you know what, first of all, be, be like, you know, there's a, there's this idea in, um, in like business psychology and it's a it's a human thing you know flow right you get into a flow state and yeah. what is a flow state a flow state is when you are completely immersed in one task in one object so for example we are probably in the state of flow right now just flowing you know getting immersed in a conversation you know if i was i was doing some work before i was doing my homework immersed immersed in that in that idea in that homework and i was in flow right but the problem is is that even still, is that consciousness, you know, like even still, while it still feels good, while it still feels wonderful, I don't think, I still think that's something like a lower plane. That is not the yeah, higher. We talked about that already. You're just, you're, you're, you're concentrating and you're, mm -hmm. you're, there's a tension there. Your brain is interacting with your task, but there's not, you don't have an aware, usually you don't have an awareness of self while you're doing that. Mm. So it takes consciousness. It's just not self-consciousness. Like it's a, it's a, it's a function of mind. It's a function of your brain, but you're not like in touch with all the other senses in your body while that's going on. And you can't be, yeah. it's, it's not wrong. It's just, it's a, it's a mode of work. You're, you're, it's a state of mind that you get in a state of being, if you will, or that you get into, uh, while you do that, a neurological state, and I guess in, in the, some of the work I would be in, almost like a trance, right, yep. that you get into, um, and it's and it just is what it is. So it's not like, a, I, I would try to, mm, 
thinking of things in terms of, oh, this is a better state than that, or this is a higher state than that, can be a little bit of a, of a trap. It's, it's just that they are, they are what they are. And mm. the question is, do you, do you want to camp out there? And uh, uh, really, that's the question. And can you, or can you choose to not camp out there is the actual question, right? Because mm. if you can choose to not do that, then there's somebody in home enough to go, now I'm choosing to not do that now. I'm not going to just pick up my phone and substitute that action for another focus point. Now I'm going to substitute that action for another. So, and none of it has to do with being present. Interesting. So so let me give you a, a, a theory that I've been working on a little bit. And this, this kind of goes back to this idea of the loud sound in the room and whether or not you choose to focus on it. So one of the one of the quotes that I really love. And I guess I'm just dropping quotes today. I don't know. I'm, you I'm, are, I'm, man. You're a quote machine. Yeah, right. I guess I'm a quote machine, but you, you know mean, what? Meme machine. <laughs> so the quote is by Oscar Wilde, and he says, everything popular is wrong. Mark Twain also said, uh, whenever I find myself going with the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. And I love that. I absolutely love that because when I think about it, I say, okay, you know what? Let's let's take that to a higher level. Not okay. You know what? Let me listen to pop me. I'm gonna listen to alternative music instead of pop music. Let's bring it into something real. Something real. Something tangible would be okay. I have many different directions to go in my life. Many different paths. I'm 20 years old right now, and I say okay. Right now, I could choose it so easily to go and party every night of the week or spend four hours a day on social media or go this way or go that way. And there are so many different ways. And then there's something that we call the righteous path. And then there's something that we call the mindful path. And some of these are good. Some of these are bad. You know, there are so many different paths that I could choose from. And some of them we could say are really bad. Like I could go on heroin, but like, you know, we're not, we're not talking about that, but there are, there are all these different paths that I can choose. And you ask the question, what is the most popular path? I'm in college and well, there is a most popular path. It's the people who go out and party every weekend and, and, you know, and drink and try to have a good time. And I, I, I'm a firm believer that people use alcohol to distract themselves from their problems. And, and a lot of these things, and, you know, they're going into, they're doing school because they, they don't like school. They just want to get a grade and their parents kind of told them to go there and the culture is yeah. telling them and, you know, that sort of idea. And well, what is it, what does it take? What does it require? For somebody to choose a different path, a righteous path, a better path, and the answer okay. is the ability to say no, the choice to say no, consciousness. Yeah. yeah, you have to be, but you have to say no for a reason, not just say no for for the sake of it. You don't want to yeah. say no because that's the right thing to do. You say no because you're saying yes to something. Yeah. And so my question to you, and this is kind of getting under the hood in terms of Nick Nick Land, sure. is sort of like, what does that mean to you? It's like, what is the, what are you saying? yes to by saying no to that and the answer i'm going to answer it <laughs> sure. i'll answer authenticity. it too. yeah yeah your, that's part your of it thing is authenticity you are completely about being authentic and and you are on hell bent on finding out what that what the hell that even means yeah. and uh it'll burn it'll burn you up and it's a it's a worthy mission well you know, it's, it's the, it's the it's the kind of thing that'll that'll fry you fry you alive, so to speak. But what's left is the is the, is the phoenix experience, right? You 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 sacrifice your your form for the sake of the emergent possibility, yeah. and you're you're definitely involved in that path. It's it's really interesting because my friends were roasting me today about I have a flip phone. Right. So everybody's got their iPhones. I got my cute little flip phone, you know, and the reason why is because I don't want to be addicted to social media technology, all these things. And I know exactly what they're doing, trying to manipulate me and I'm not down. For it. <laughs> well, you know, this is interesting. And so, and you know, you're not paying me for counseling or coaching, but I'm going to go there. So like, but I'll take it. You, you have to watch out <laughs> for yourself about your own identity wrapped up in that resistance. Yeah. Yeah. Like being a dissident. Yeah. See, now remember we talked about who am I, the labels that you now now there's a goodness in this, and I don't want to just say you're wrong or bad by any stretch of the imagination, but pay it because you're you're an astute guy. You're paying really close attention to, to these experiences in your life. So mm -hmm. notice how you when you feel these other people like they want me to do it, and I'm not falling for it. Okay. What happens in you is you feel strong right then. So you get to feel your strength in that resistance 
There's this mm-hmm. righteousness. There's this resi- There's this like, and it's all good. It's like, yeah, because who doesn't like to feel strong and, and like, I'm going to stand up for the right thing. Yeah, man. And in your case, it is the right thing. You're not standing up for, hey, let's do some drugs and let's party hardy. And, and, and you know, hey, there's a time for party hardy. Um, Great. And, and, yeah. And so you want to deal yourself into that appropriately as well. But well, it, well, so, so that's the ahead. thing. So, you know, I, I've been trying to ask myself that question for a long time. Right. And my, my family, they, they make fun of me for this all the time where, you know, they, they just kind of joke around. And they're like, well, if you tell Nick to do something, he's definitely going to go the opposite because he likes that route, you yeah. know, and and maybe maybe part of my persona, you know, maybe, maybe. part of my my persona is. I like to, I like to do things that are opposite, but I, I ask myself that question all the time, and I'm always trying to figure that out. And I don't know if I've had an answer yet. Of am I doing this for me, or am I doing it for other people? Right. And when I say well, for other people, I mean yeah, because I like to be a dissident. Well, you can tell if it's for other people when you don't care what they think. Hmm. Do I care about what they think? That's a great question. I mean, um, so. I've had a lot of, a lot of thought about this, you know, like there are times where I really feel like I don't care what people think. There are times that I'm really like, okay, you know what? Like I am rock solid. I'm going to do this for me and it's going to make my life better. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure like I could put myself in the place that I was when I got the flip phone. I was like, I'm I'm doing that for me. Like I'm doing Mm -hmm. that for me. But then at the same time, you know, like there's definitely, there's definitely a part of me that cares about other people. So for example, you want to hear something funny? So sure. One of the, one of the biggest, um, you can find this online. It's, it's really funny. I don't care about it. Well, I guess I don't care about it. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> So there's this thing called Barstool. Have you ever heard of Barstool Sports? No. Barstool Sports is, is a huge social media company. Everybody goes crazy for it. Everybody loves it. You know, like viral videos they post online. Everybody checks it out. You know, sort of like highlights of the dumb stuff that people do, you know, and, um, and they have Barstool Indiana. So Barstool for Indiana University, Barstool for, you know, pick your college, Kentucky, Alabama. So they have that. So somebody saw me at a party with a flip phone and they took a video and sent it into Barstool Indiana and they posted it on Barstool Indiana. So I think it got 3000 likes, 20, 20,000 people saw it. Like this is, this is big. There were 40,000 people at the university. This is a lot of people viewing it. And I woke up to that text that morning. Cause of course I don't have social media or, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't really go on social media. I just, you know, I still have it on my laptop. And, um, and literally, literally I get a text that morning. Hey, you know, you were on Barcel, Indiana, you know, you're, you're going to have a, a few of my friends text me. You're going to have a rough day today, right? People are going to be <laughs> making fun of you and all that stuff. And I asked myself for two hours. So I had two hours before my day started, before I got to see people. And I asked myself for two hours, do I care? Mm-hmm. Do I care? Whether <laughs> you or not? for two hours, that sort of answers your question. I think I cared. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the, the answer to that question is either if it's fast, right? I don't care. And then you're off to your next thing and it's not in your head. If you're on it for two hours, you care, right? Yeah, and yeah. there's no harm. There's no harm, no foul there, man. That's all legit. We live in a social world. We're relational beings. You have to have people in your life. How you get along with other people matters. And what people think of you has an impact on you. And we're wired that way. You can't help it. Mm-hmm. You, is it, remember I, I was talking about Ron Siegel. One of the things he talked about, uh, uh, the, the Harvard professor, one of the things he talked about is like our our neurology can't help but do this comparison because uh, it's wired in. Like, is that guy going to be able to uh, on, take ourselves back to like the savannah, right, where the brain kind of developed? And it's like, is that guy going to beat me up? Is, yep. is he going to take ostracize me, down? me? Yeah. Yeah. Or can I get the can I get the 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 hot you know, female in the tribe, you know, or whatever's going on for the, for the neurology there, there's a relational component that was really about survival. Um, Yeah. But now it's about flip phones, right? (laughs) And our neurology can't tell the difference between those stories. It still thinks it's about survival. Well, it's super interesting. You know, I look at that all the time and I'm like, you know what? There are two different planes that I could exist on. Right. And that's not in a metaphysical sense. It's just, it's just, (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just, that's just the way it is. Like I could, I could use that. Yeah. Like primal part of my brain, which is excessively human by the way. Right. Like that is the way that we are wired, but or yeah. also, you know, I could have that completely authentic mode of 
I don't care what people think about me, right? I am me and I made the decision and I'm going to stick with that decision because I don't care what people think about me. And um, I, I feel like over the years, I've definitely cared less, you know, like I'm definitely, I'm definitely between the two planes, but um, well, part of it is. is That's it, human, man. That's yeah. welcome to humanity. Yeah. God, it's, it's such a. That's such a the yin one. yang. That's a, we're in it and we're out of it. We're the, it's the both and that's the conundrum of incarnation. You know, we're the divine and the incarnate. We're the whole and the part. Yeah. All at the same time. And the fact that we are both of those things and we know about both of those things is uh, uh, is itself a statement about the nature of creation. And so it's a it's a pretty phenomenal place to be. So yeah, that's the work. You're you're just it's today it's the flip phone and people, tomorrow it's something else, but that's the work. And so you know, I would say authentically, you do care about people, right? Yes, you do care what they think. But the thing is, it's like, okay, it's, it sucks that they're judging you. That's, they yeah. are short, cha- it short changes themselves by doing that. Because what you're doing is a pretty grand social experiment in a way. You're really saying, I'm choosing to do something different because I can and it feels right to me. Well, you know, in some other group, that would be celebrated as like a pretty high act of courage and bravery and authenticity. Well, that's it's the narrative like, right there. Yep, yeah, that's the narrative. Right, exactly. But the question is, how does it feel? And I don't think you're doing these things because you want to be seen as different. You're doing them because you really, something in your core truly believes that this matters. Yeah, I mean, I think personally, I think I'm going to have to answer that question in a few years. I think personally, like I've been asking that question to myself all the time, you know, and I've been analyzing myself and yes, it is a self-experiment, you know, like it's, I I would, I would say it wasn't a design self-experiment, but it was just natural. It just came up. I was like, you know what, let me try something new in my life. And that is an experiment. Well, but that's, that is core you, right? Because like, let me give you another example. One you just said in this, in the session, you, Mm -hmm. you talked about, uh, I decided I was going to pack a week into a few days. Yep. Just to see. <laughs> okay. Well, there's yep. another experiment, right? So you're you're tinkering with the inputs of life to see how you do. I, you know, I did something similar when I was a kid. I uh, was a, a younger, a little bit younger than you. I decided to see how much could I work. And I, I had four jobs and I was, and I had two, had four hours of sleep and two, two hour shifts. Wow. I was, and I had a Volkswagen van back in the day and I would sleep in the parking lot. Uh, and I'd get up and I'd go to work and, uh, and I did that for about two weeks and for okay. no re- I, for no other reason, just to see if I could. You know? And, <laughs> and uh, how did, how did it turn out? It turned out I, uh, one of my jobs was I was a cook at Denny's. <laughs> so, okay. And so I was like opening up a bag of hash browns, you know, with a knife and I went whack and I sliced my finger really deep. Wow. That's and that four ended hours two of, sleep, of my other yeah. jobs because I was a guitar player and a lifeguard. <laughs> so, yeah. so I lost three of my four jobs in, in one stroke. <laughs> well, I love that. You know, part of part of being young is pushing my limits. And yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is that is, first of all, you know what, if you if you never push your limits, how are you going to know where your limits are? But the but that the key about this, see, is you're doing it in a way where you're actually finding out. It's not just an idea for you. And that's the difference between what you're doing and what a lot of other people go, well, yeah, I know I could do that. I think I could. Yeah, of course I could. But you're going, no, I want to know. I don't want to just think about it. That's a huge, huge difference. And so there's something about you that insists on the experience of, that's why I said authenticity. This is authentic. This is real. And so when you fast forward your dial, you know, 10, 20 years from now, you're going to be able to say, look, here's what's true about searching for authenticity. And I know because I lived it. Mm, Experience. I experienced it. Interesting. You're not letting anybody tell you what your limits are. You're going to find out for yourself. And that's the only way to really know. And I can tell you, I've had some pretty outrageous experiences because I put myself into some spiritual communities and, you know, 
uh, it gets really crazy, uh, you know, in terms of, I don't mean like insane, but, but in terms of the amount of things that I've done, that's similar. So I kind of, you know, I'm projecting a little bit because I see myself in you there and, and as someone who's really passionately interested in finding out what's true. And finding out the world, like I, like that blows my mind and, and you're willing to suffer for it too. I'm willing to yeah. suffer for it too. Yeah. I know. I know. Trust me. Once I start traveling to different countries, my world is going to be blown out of proportion. No, because... no, that's really important. That's something I wish I had done earlier because oh, it, really, uh, it, it changes, it changes a lot. I was talking to someone the other day about, about whether or not like I should study abroad and go to all these places. And yes. And, yes. No, no, <laughs> he, no hesitation. <laughs> yeah. Because look at the world that you're in, you know, Look at the world. You're dealing with the judgment and there's no support for you. There, there's, there's support for what you want to do in the world. You're just not going to get it where you're at right now in, in finance school, you know, in college. You know, yeah. 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 At, the, at the rational Kelly School of Business. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it, it's just that the, the, what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to do is. Um, a different mode of being. That's the way well, I love to phrase it. It's a pure spiritual exercise. It's, yes. It's, it's an authentic spiritual exercise. And, oh, God. And, I love that. I love that. And, um, and man, I, uh, I, I'll continue. You know, I'm continuing. You, uh, you, know, you don't have this, a choice. I really don't, right? Because no, no. <laughs> what I've noticed is that whenever I do things that I'm supposed to do or whenever I do things that, like, you know, other people end up doing or, you know, something that's, yeah, usually things that other other people end up doing. I don't know if that again. I don't know if that's correlational or you know because everything popular is wrong or because I like to do things that other people don't like to do. But whenever I end up doing that stuff, I hate it. It's terrible and I, it's it's miserable. So I guess I guess I'm stuck on this path. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a choice. It's driving you. It's sort of like <clears throat> that's the way these things go. And some some people just are born with this fire that just kind of consumes um, the ego and uh, it, and it takes time, uh, but it, uh, uh, it, this is kind of what it looks like. And it can be, it's a difficult path. It really is. Well, that's, that's one of the things I was thinking of, you know, and this, this is probably the takeaway message from this whole thing is just, I, I, I agree, right? Like we're, we're to some degree, we're not in control. I'm not in control of this. I'm just sort of, in for the ride, right? I, and I like to think that. I like to think that I'm on a roller coaster and I'm going from one place probably to the same place. It doesn't really matter where I'm going, it, but I'm strapping in and I'm here for the ride, you know. And maybe I can control a little bit. I could, I could raise my hands and you know and scream a little bit and do all yeah. that stuff. But you know what? I'm just pretty much here for the ride, and I'm going to enjoy the crap out of it. And the final takeaway is. I'm not going to attempt to change it. I'm not, I'm not going to try to jump off the ride. I'm not going to try to try to do anything to manipulate the ride. I'm just, I'm just here for the ride. And the ride is the ride. Right. So, you, yeah. so that's, uh, that's fabulous. There's, a, there's one piece I would like to leave you with, if you don't mind. I love it. I, uh, I was a, um, a meditation teacher for quite a few years and, and because I had a fabulous teacher who kind of what I would call take the, took the lid off of me and I kind of, you know, did this whole connected to the bigger thing and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. all that, all that stuff. But this guy was uh, a very interesting character and he said some interesting things. One of the most powerful messages that stuck with me for all these decades, and I'd like to give it to you, is move towards peace. Mm. Very and it's everything that's powerful is usually ultimately simple, right? And so it's kind of like, um, and this was really important because there's a lot of people, and you have a character type that gets you, you get lit up by the dynamics and the drama, and then and and I do too. I love it, but that in itself is a little bit of a trap, right? It's lovely. It's like the fireworks are beautiful, but they're not the sky. And so, um, uh, the the deeper the, in that moment that you were in, it was just beingness. Move towards peace. So there's the drama and there's the peace, right? And so it's like uh, mm. I, I'll tell you a quick little story about. Um, he would do. Um, he'd have students that would come to him and go, "Oh, teacher, I'm. Um, uh, I sit down and I meditate, and and I had this amazing experience. I 
I had all this energy coursing through me and these lights going off. And I felt like I saw angels and, you know, dust from the heavens. And he would pat, pat her on the, heaven, on the head and say, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> move towards peace. God loves you very much. And send her off. And then another guy would come and go, oh, master, I've been meditating for like months and, and nothing ever happens. There's all these other people and they're having all these big experiences. And he and, and, and I just nothing, but nothing happened. And he patted me on and said, oh, God bless you. God must love you very much. Mm. Move towards peace and just send him off. Interesting. Mm. It's interesting, you know. Oh, God. God, there's so there's so much that I could bring on that, but I think that is a perfect, perfect way to end it. And everybody move towards peace. And Brett Hill, thank you for coming on and tell people where they can find you. Languageofmindfulness.com is my website. And I have a podcast there as well, where I talk about a lot of the things that uh, we were talking about in terms of mindfulness and communications. I do some interviews with interesting people. Um, so you can go there and see what I'm about. Um, I have a... Um, how to start a mindfulness practice there at languageofmindfulness.com forward slash now. Uh, it's just a very brief, simple, easy to use. Anybody can do a template for how to start a mindfulness meditation practice with an FAQ. Um, so I hope, and that's, you know, the foundational practice is this basic mindfulness meditation, not for everybody. And I talk about that in the FAQ, but it is for most people. Um, awesome. awesome. So check it out. And yes, all the all that stuff will be in the links in the description below. Yay. So, Brett Hill, thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Nick Lugo Show with Brett Hill. To support this podcast, please give me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And so I'll leave you with a quote from, well, the best, Tony Robbins. A belief is a poor substitute for an experience. Take that with you. And well, I hope to see you next time.